Fun. I want to welcome you all to Horizons this morning, whether you are our guest or a, a grandparent, aunt, uncle, or whether you are Horizons. And we encourage you, invite you, welcome you with arms wide open to allow this to be your home and to be one of the places where you encounter the Holy Spirit and God. Everything to morning, this is morning. I just want to praise God for the children that we have, that your, for your children, and the powerful message and the powerful joy that they bring, knowing that it's all for God's glory, that we get the chance to say, this is wonderful because of what God's doing. And if that is that wonderful, there's no reason that we can't run towards that, welcome that into our lives. We're all about life changed, life changers here, becoming life changed and then becoming life changers, about seeing how Christ enters our hearts, redirects our, our, our whole lives towards really big, important, powerful things, and then flows through us that we get to be a part of changing others' lives. Your children and your grandchildren are up here becoming life change life changers. Our confirmands are here this morning representing their steps, becoming life change life changers. That is what we do. That is what we're inviting you into this morning, whether you are our guest or whether you are Horizons, that we move in that direction. We are in our current sermon series of Simplify, and we're talking about getting out some of the clutter, getting out some of the, uh, the, the mess and, and the complication, the complexities that crowd out this area where the Holy Spirit is able to work in our lives. Because when we are so cluttered and so messy and so frazzled, it's really difficult for Jesus to have a place in our hearts for the Spirit to move and do anything in life. So we're talking about, we're talking about getting a big snow shovel. Uh, forgive, me, forgive me that I just said snow shovel, but we're talking about this big shovel right here. We're, we're clearing the walks so that the Spirit can do the heavy and the hard work. Now today, our particular focus is on two things. One is seasons, and two is a particular season of God bringing horizons along and reaching out and pouring into the lives of children in India as well as, as children right here. So I want to share with you some scripture this morning that allows us to focus. I know you've heard these words before. Uh, you may not have realized where these came from, but today, this morning we're going to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, reminding us that there is a season for everything, a time for every matter under the sun, a time for giving birth and a time for dying, a time for planting and a time for uprooting what was planted, a time for killing and a time for healing, a time for tearing down and a time for building up, a time for crying and a time for laughing, a time for mourning and a time for dancing, a time for throwing stones and a time for gathering stones, a time for embracing and a time for avoiding embraces, a time for searching and a time for losing, a time for keeping and a time for throwing away, a time for tearing and a time for repairing, a time to keep silent and a time for speaking, a time for loving and a time for hating, a time for war and a time for peace. Today, Scripture reminding us that there is a time for everything. The times that we loathe and fear, there is a time for those. It's not always that those seasons and those times are inappropriate in our lives. A time for the things that we love and welcome into our lives, there is a season for that. And if you're not in it, it is coming. You see, today we're reminded that the current situation we're in, if it's not a positive one, it is not a train wreck. Rather, it is a bumpy stretch along the track as we realize that our current situation is not our ultimate fate, but another part of our journey, we can remember that God's design for our lives and the points along the way that we go through, both positive and negative, are part of that design for our growth, for our perhaps correcting a path, or for our blessing as well. That God has seasons and they start and they finish. They don't last forever, even the good ones. 
So today as we embrace those seasons, we remember that in the good seasons, we embrace and appreciate them. And we don't look towards the next season when there's a good one. We stop and, as they say, smell the roses. And when there's, a, when there's an uncomfortable or a season that we don't want to be in, then we need to learn to accept it and investigate what is God doing in the midst of this season. See, Jesus went through a powerful season too. This parade into Jerusalem was his last public thing that he did before his death. If you look at it from that perspective, that was not a celebration of this parade. It shouldn't have been. And yet as we explore the deeper things of what Jesus was doing, we know that this was a season of Jesus' sacrifices so that we might have freedom in our lives which makes it a very powerful season and something indeed worth celebrating. You see, God laid, has laid and continues to lay several seasons on horizons as well. And today we celebrate a particular season that we anticipate and look forward to lasting for several years, several decades at horizons, and that is of Project Hope of caring for children in India through two homes. You see, last September the 20th, God revealed to us where we're heading in the future. One of them is that we will bring all children and youth, all children of youth, closer to Christ. You saw them on the stage, and we're going to show you more. We're going to introduce you to several of them in just a moment. The other that God revealed to us is maturing in the Holy Spirit, seeking, being aware of the Spirit, seeing where it is leading us. October 11th, a rebirth of Project Hope came about because of where God was leading us. And we shared about where we had been in Project Hope with, our, with Pratheeksha, our home, and where we were heading with Pratheeksha and a second home named Bethel. November 11th, we celebrated Orphan Sunday or recognized Orphan Sunday, and we challenged Horizons to increase their support of children by 22 sponsorships. That's a huge number. By December 31st, 2015, 24 of those 22 sponsorships had been filled, 109% of our goal. February 9th, the first vision team went over to India that has gone in several years to be face-to-face -face with those folks, those directors, and those children. This is Horizon's season of letting God do extraordinary work in the lives of people all around the world. We left February 9th. There were seven of us from Horizons. Twelve days we were there and we visited two travel homes, or two, excuse me, two children's homes. You can see some of the travel details and uh, it, it was a long trip, but it was awesome. We went from Omaha to Chicago to Frankfurt and finally Chennai. When we landed in Chennai, we first went to Pratheeksha. Let's check out that next slide here. And uh, so Pratheeksha is in the south. And then we went back to Chennai. That's the central place. We flew most of the time that we were in the country. And then we went north to Muniguda, where Bethel is located. We spent that time, and then we flew back to Chennai, and we went out. Our daily routine was that we would wake up, we would pray, we would have the most glorious breakfast as our hosts welcomed us to the Indian culture and Indian life and cuisine. And we spent group time in the morning with the directors, with each other, just focusing on what's happening in that situation and in, in those areas. Then we had lunch, and then we got to spend some personal time, or as I like to call it, nap time for about an hour and a half. And then in the mid-afternoon to late afternoon, the children were free from school, they were free from their activities, and they would flood into the children's homes, and we would just pour out onto them and they would pour out onto us and we would just celebrate being with each other and the gifts and the games that you all played we were there and we were we were just sharing our time in the evening then we would eat or no excuse me we would worship then we would eat then we would reflect a little bit and fall deep into sleep and I want to take you there a little bit more by just introducing you to uh, what it looks like to be there and the children that we got to meet let's well, take we've got the band back together again looks like what a great time we had, and uh, as you see here, if, you, if you've not uh, had a chance to meet her when she's been here, sister Jessie is this amazing, beautiful woman sitting next to me, and, and the story that we learned from her and the time that we had, how she had an idea, 
and she started very small with just one room with an idea that she could change lives of the young women or some of the young women in India. And it started very small and it grew and now through the generosity of those of us at Horizons, her, her dream is continuing and it's growing and, and the women whose lives she's changed are now changing other lives. And we had such a wonderful time. Uh, even when the state uh, in India has made it very difficult to house a lot of the children at Prashika, Sister Jesse and Sister Molly found a way, again through our help, to still provide an education and opportunity for these young women by housing them in hostels out. And then on Saturday, they travel many times for hours by train and by bus to come back to visit and renew their friendships with the uh, children that they grew up with. And, and you can see the love that they have for Sister Jessie as, as they come through the gates and greet everyone. And it was amazing to see the poise and the confidence that these young women had had uh, throughout the years and how they talked with such excitement about where they were going and what they were learning and what their career was going to be and how they were going to go out into the world and change lives as their lives had been changed. And as Jason said, there is this rule at Prasika that every afternoon you get to take a nap and, and they're really underrated. Uh, it was one of the best times. But what followed the nap was probably the highlight, one of the highlights of the day. And there were many highlights, but it was when you woke to the sound of these children just with joy and happiness and playing. They stop by and they work on their homework for a little bit in the courtyard at Persica, and then they get playtime, and then before they go home, they get a snack. And, and for some of them, you could tell that was gonna be a big part of the nourishment that they had for the day that was provided by Sister Jessie and Sister Molly. But what was fun was that as it was time for them to go back to their home, and there's little villages that are right outside of Persica, they competed to hold our hands as we walked them back home. And they were so happy and proud to be able to show us where they lived. And these homes were so meager, certainly by our standards. I mean, no doors, no windows, no running water. And yet they were so happy and proud to be able to show us where they lived. And it was such a great reminder that it's not about all the things we have, but it's really what we can do to impact and change others' lives. And, and again, through the generosity of Horizons, we're certainly doing that all the way around the world with the kids in India. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I once preached on how men don't ride on uh, the back of men's motorcycles. <laughs> and I'm happy to tell you that the bro code doesn't apply in India. <laughs> um, the extraordinary thing about what God's doing at both Prathiksha and Bethel, our second home, is that this isn't just welcoming children into the confines of a gated community and sheltering them. These become pivotal anchors for the whole village, the whole community around them. That th th There is no way that those villages and communities could sustain themselves without the presence of these two homes and all of the work that is pouring out from them. And it was phenomenal to see people come that, weren't, that didn't have any connection to the home otherwise come and ask for help or, or, or share their story and just be received into these Christian arms, which is a, a very rare presence in the midst of a Hindu-populated um, country. Now, this gentleman, um, we don't even remember his name or um, whose children he, he had <laughs> or grandchildren. Uh, we don't really know, but he said... I want to take you on a ride. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, let me drive. And he's like, no. But, um, <laughs> but it was so cool um, to be there and to see how the influence, the presence of us with them mattered in a really big way. That we didn't, I, I didn't give him any money. I didn't build him a house. I didn't paint his, his front yard or any, what, I don't know why I would do that, but I didn't do any of that. I simply loved him and welcomed him into my life and said, take me on a ride. And this guy, he, we went through all kinds of places that I don't think that a, a, a white Westerner is supposed to go, even to the point that he took me down these steps to a river where people were washing and bathing and washing their clothes because he wanted, he was so excited to welcome that presence into, the, into his world. And how much that meant. Now, when we were in Bethel, the second home, we saw the same thing, that people just thrived on the presence of those homes. Even if they didn't agree with Christianity or like that presence, they knew 
that their children were being cared for, that that a powerful difference was being made in their community. And it was awesome to be face to face. It's easy to give money to something or to, to pray for something and say, I know it's for good, but it's powerful when you go face to face and you can say, you child or you community, you are thriving today because of a small part that we played in God's big role that he does in the midst of hurting and broken places. And it was phenomenal to see that. And it was a good ride. Just in case you're wondering, Jason didn't wash in the river. I think after four years of marriage, he had that inner voice saying he probably shouldn't. I think he washed your face, but he left his clothes on. Uh, (laughs) Um... Sorry, I thought he had something to say. <laughs> um, so people have been asking me what my favorite part about India was, and it's, that's a really, really hard question to answer. Um, but now that we've been back for about a month, the things that surface to my mind are three things, really. The joy that we experience, the community, and also the hope. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures, blowing bubbles with some of the girls after school at Prithiksha. Um, John Piper, a writer and professor of theology, defines joy as this. Joy is a state of mind and orientation of the heart. It is a settled state of contentment. It isn't flighty or easily swayed. It is someone who provides a source of happiness, not someone who's always looking for their own happiness. How many of us can say that we have that truly living within us? Um, And we have so much here. We own so much. I never thought of myself as someone who thought that money was the key to happiness, but over there I was surprised and sometimes stunned by the amount of joy that came from the directors and the children, even in the midst of their desperate need. And it all stemmed from um, Sister Jesse and Sister Molly and Susma and Prabhin, their hearts for Christ and how they had fed that into the children. They all had this true joy. Um, This picture also reminds me of the community that we felt over there. This young lady in the wheelchair, um, her story was something that really hammered home that idea of community to me. Um, She had polio when she was little and it made her so she can't um, walk. And also the chair she was in was not the right size for her, so she had a really hard time propelling it herself. So, But every day after school, we watch her friends just gather around her and make sure she got wherever they were all going. She was able to fully participate in all the activities that we were doing. And it was all because her friends just surrounded her and um, carried her in that way. And it was really beautiful. Um, Wherever we went in India, Prithiksha or Bethel, we always felt that we had that same sense of community with other people. Um, We got hugs and people held our hands everywhere we went. Um, It was just wonderful, that sense of community that we sometimes lack here, I think. And finally, this picture makes me think of hope. Um, When I first met this young girl, in, uh, who uses her wheelchair. Uh, I, I work with kids here, I'm a physical therapist with children, and several things about her situation kind of broke my heart. The fact that she had gotten polio, which we don't worry about here anymore, the fact that her chair wasn't the right size. Um, and when we left Prathiksha, I really continued to struggle with some of those emotions. Um, but then fast forward to when we got to Bethel, and they have a college of science on campus, and the first day, they took us to some of the classrooms uh, where they were learning science and Prabhin, the director, introduced us and said that I had studied science as well and then I had gotten my doctorate in physical therapy and I was really embarrassed but I was like, you know, hi. (laughs) Um, And I didn't even really think much more about that moment until the last night we were in Bethel uh, at the market, some young women came up to me and said, we were in that room, we were in that class and we met you and you inspired us, you encouraged us to keep studying science and and encourage us to continue in our education. And um, I was floored and humbled. Something I had already kind of forgotten meant so much to these girls. And that factors into my hope for India, that young women like that um, are encouraged by us giving them some financial resources so that they can continue to study, continue to have nutrition, 
and that they can continue in their education and um, eventually, you know, become professionals in their fields of science and maybe someday a young girl won't get polio or malaria or will have access to proper rehabilitation and medical equipment. And so those are my favorite things about our trip, the joy, the community, and uh, the hope. Okay, um, the irony of this, I'm gonna share a little bit that I got chosen to share about food because even though I am half Indian, my taste buds I think came from my Swedish and Norwegian side. And so all of the amazing spices, I love them, except the chilies. And everything was doused in chili. So luckily, I tried to sit next to Jason the entire time because then I could kind of shove some of them, that off on him. But I find it humorous that I was chosen to share this. So, <laughs> um, Anyway, um, one of the verses that I came across that I feel like really hits home for our travels and for this specific um, topic is Matthew 25, verse 35, and that is, for I was hungry, um, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. And I think that is our journey and what we saw in India 100%. I mean, everybody that we shared time with um, at both of the children's homes really, really um, gave us their love and gave the children their love through food. I mean, it was a huge part of, of how they gave to us. They don't have very much, they didn't, they don't have very much food either, but um, they poured their hearts and souls into it, and we were fed a lot. <laughs> we were fed very frequently, we were fed abundantly, um, and it just, they really truly did pour their hearts out into us and into the children through that food. Um, I think Jason had mentioned, uh, or actually Jim, I think, how when we were at Prathiksha, Sister Jessie and Sister Molly had these children from the village come in every day after their schooling, and, and they fed them. And the children knew they had a safe place, and it may have been the safest place in their day, um, but they did. They fed them every single day, and again, the joy in their, in their eyes, and the, the kids had very little, but they... They loved every moment of it, and I'm glad we got to witness that. Um, when the girls that aren't currently staying at Prathiksha came to visit for the weekends before they left, um, Sister Jessie and Sister Molly would send care packages with them of food and other items that they need. And again, that's that pouring out of, of love and doing God's work um, by making sure they're nourished when they're not physically at Prathiksha, which is incredible that they could do that. Um, and then when we were at Bethel, we ate with, we, di we had dinner with the kids. And um, we all would sit around and um, have our rice and our lentils and a and little bit of vegetables. And we had the opportunity to um, take a look at how that food was made. And I don't know how we would do that here. <laughs> it was... Um, an outside kitchen with just with fire and big pots and they were feeding hundreds of kids and hundreds of you know with adults and kids um, in an outside kitchen so it's pretty amazing what they could do when we took that tour um, they kind of showed us how everything worked and they also took us into this little um, I don't even know what you would call it little pantry area and um, inside of there, there was a little pile of vegetables that they had um, received recently. And um, had somebody had shared with us when they were walking us around that these vegetables were very rare up until the time that we started supporting them here. Um, and that the children rarely had any vegetables at all. So that's, it was, sad, but it was nice to see that we are making that difference for them there. Um, I think I'll end it with that. <laughs> I just want to um, talk 
again, just how, what an awesome ministry that we are partnering with. We are partnering with True Heroes in Bethel and Prithiksha. These homes are such a beacon of light to their communities. Not only are they serving the children that we're supporting, but they are serving hundreds of others, like everyone has talked about, the kids that would come after school at Prithiksha and um, at Bethel, they have a daycare center where kids can come during the day and have a safe place to learn and to get good food and um, to just hear the message of Christ. And so there are two different um, stories I want to share with you. Uh, is there another picture? Sorry. Yes, this one. Um, so in this, in this photo is a picture. The girl um, by her father, the tallest one, her name is Ronnie, and she is seven years old, and she is the oldest girl of five children. Her mother is only 22 years old, and Ronnie has lived at Bethel for two years. Um, Bethel has just proven to be the safest place for her. Her father suffers from very extreme alcoholism, and um, while we were there, actually, Bethel calls parents meetings for the village parents every month, and so we had one of those while we were there, and um, I noticed that Ronnie's mother had two huge black eyes, and she was just, she wasn't her normal self. She was very down, and so I got to talk to her, and um, it just, her husband had gone on a, a rampage when he was in a when he was intoxicated and he ended up destroying their whole roof their home is very 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 small and has had nothing but clothes and a few pots and pans and he ended up selling the pots and pans and burning all of their clothes in this state and beating um her in front of all these sweet children so ronnie is at bethel and these children come to us during the day um so with that story it is just amazing that they get to come to this campus. Ronnie's mother, they, Bethel is doing everything that they can for her. They actually ended up replacing that roof over their head. They hardly have a good roof over the kids' heads, but they gave this family a new roof. They um, gave them some clothes to help them and some pots and pans, and were able to just be that beacon of light, and the children are just being so loved at Bethel. They're being cared for, and they're given that safe ho home in um, this family gets to know more about Christ. This entire village gets to see something done for them that doesn't happen in a Hindu culture. They get to see the light of Christ in that. And so Bethel, just like Pratiksha, provides that light of hope. And then you can go back to the last photo. Um, another story that happened while we were there is with this little girl, Trishna. Our first day at Bethel, I walked downstairs and Sushman and Prabhman had their hands over their head and they were just saying, um, and they were praying and they were speaking with each other and seemed very concerned. And so I found out they're like, we're just, we don't know what to do. We have a three-year-old little girl here whose father wants her to stay. And we don't know if we should take her. Um, usually children in orphanages in India come at least at five so they can be a little self-sufficient. Um, and so a three-year-old, that would be a really, it would be a blessing, but a burden for them. And so they ended up, of course, taking her in. Um, Trishna's story, her, within the last two years, her, her sister, her 12-year-old sister died in a motorcycle accident. Their whole family was on a motorcycle going to the market to get bangles, and um, they crashed, and she passed away, and he, her father in this photo was left with a really broken leg, and um, he lost his job because of that disability. And then last year, because of the lack of resources, her mother wasn't able to get treatment and she ended up dying of malaria, which is something very treatable. And so within the last two years, they have lost everything. And so her father, without having anywhere else to turn, not being able to provide for his little girl, he brought her and he was crying and he just had so much love for her. He and She ended up staying at Bethel for 10 days and he came back right the day before Anthony and I left, and um, he said, I can't eat without my Trishna, I can't sleep without her, and so he ended up taking her home, and we, we praised God for that, that they were reunified, and we, we were trusting that she will have her needs met, and sometimes I'm asking, God, why did she even come? She came in like a hurricane. She just, there was so much love in that little girl, and she stole every single heart on that campus, and um, I'm asking God why she even came, and I know it's because of the love that he has for her. I know it's because they, he wanted, Jesus wanted them to know his love. And for the first time, they got to hear about Christ. And they got to have Bethel be that safe place of refuge in, 
and of courage for them and to give them hope for the future. Now this man is caring for her and they're doing good, um, but we just praise God that we are a part of ministries that are caring for children like this, that we're not just sending money or supporting um, people in a faraway land. Like We are supporting Ronnie's family and Trishna's family and these kids have stories and names and it's just so amazing that at Horizons we get to be a part of that and be a part of that kingdom building in that way. So that was extremely scary, but I was glad there was a lot of them. Um, and just like it took all of those hands to, to lift me up into the air like that, it takes a lot of hands to keep these homes running. And it's just so incredible um, that we get to be a part of that. And it's been so encouraging to be a part of what um, they're doing there on the ground and on the front lines. And I remember I started coming to Horizon six years ago, and I think it was maybe the fourth Sunday I'd ever come to a Sunday service. And I was sitting over here, and Sister Jessie was here, and she was talking, and I, I bawled the entire time she was talking about just what these girls face and the, the hope that they're able to offer them. And I, was, I just remember thinking, man, I want to be a part of that someday. And it was totally just a dream, but I actually got to go. Um, two years ago was the first time that I got to see Sister Jessie um, in India and it's just been so fun to see even two years later even though they've been through so many more trials and persecutions and everything since then they're still faithfully loving the girls and it's so fun to see the girls just interact with Sister Jessie as they joke around and they have just so much joy like has been said and just the pride and Sister Jessie, Sister Molly and Elsa who are the leaders at Pratiksha they have just so much pride in knowing where these girls have come from and what they have the opportunity to do and that they really are becoming life changers and so it's been so cool to see that leadership and on that same trip um, two years ago that I met Sister Jessie is when I got to meet Susma and Prabhin um, in person for the first time and um, since then I've got to spend a lot of time with them and I've begun to get to know some of the other leaders at Bethel a little bit more and it was really fun this time there's a watchman named Porme who um, who is at Bethel and this time, I've always had really fun interactions with him, but this time he asked me if I would play volleyball with him and so we grabbed one of the little balls that came in the Christmas bags that we brought from this last Christmas and we drew a line in the sand and we just hit balls back and forth to each other and he was always like, hit it harder, hit it harder. And it was just so fun because you don't see a lot of Indian men who are willing to go out and have so much fun with the kids. A lot of them are very dignified and um, and everything. So it was just fun to know that they get that loving atmosphere um, at, these, at these homes and not only the adults that we've got to connect with but the kids. Um, one of the sweetest children in the entire world, his name is Bosanto and he's in the green shirt next to Allie there and if we could take him home we would take him home in a minute because he's just the best and it's been so fun to see him grow over the course of the last two years and he's one of the kids that I've connected with the most but I, I haven't always been able to connect with all of the kids like I have with him, so it was really fun this time seeing our team connect with kids in different ways and fill different roles. Like Steve really got to interact with a kid named Bacas, and I've tried so hard to love on him, but it's always so awkward, and it's just never been good. And our conversations just never go anywhere, but Steve like instantly was best friends, and Bacas was so encouraged by that because he had a lot of really hard exams at that time. So. Um, I know that that really encouraged him during that time and, and Sarah like she mentioned with the older girls being a role model like those are roles that I could never have filled but that God provided the these people to these kids to fill those special roles so if you're thinking about coming on a trip I would encourage you to to pray and, and just to know that if God is calling you to come that he's equipped you to really play a special role um, in somebody's life and that and also knowing that you can you can point the kids to Jesus who can fill all the roles and who is perfect uh, who's the perfect role model for the kids anyway too so thanks so one of the reasons why I went uh, on this trip is I wanted to do something bigger than myself uh, bigger than my 40 or 50 hour a week job